Ya. Uh, I think time can we start with the question? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. In the absence of our chairman of the Vega Center Climate Change for Atmospheric Oceanic Science, uh, that is SK Satish, she has, he is in a quarantine. One of his staff <laughs> happened to be identified today. He's in quarantine. He couldn't able to make it. And also, we also miss uh, Professor J. Srinivasan. He is also the founder of the Vega Center Climate Change. And he is also oceanic studies so professor, we distinguished uh, scientist of our institute. He's also couldn't able to make it. His daughter is a little sick. That's why. And uh, we have with us our uh, international president, Yashwant Patil. It's a great honor to receive you, sir. There. And also we have with us our vice chancellor of the uh, vice chancellor of uh, uh, Adi Chichuri University, Chandrasekhar Shetty, a renowned ophthalmologist. And uh, he is a lion. So welcome to you, sir. It's an honor. And also we have with our secretary, Ravi Kumar, and our coordinator, national coordinator, Javiji Rao, and other distinguished members who are participating in this program. I have a great pleasure welcoming you all. Coming to the subject matter. Well, the, the introductory remarks of this one, what I like to make few words, this measures needed to build a fairer, a healthier world for the survival of the humanity. Well, of course, the measures are needed to build fairer and healthier world. Health is a must. The World Health Day theme of 7th April and Earth Day is today, 22nd April. They are acting in conjunction. That's what she's going to cover both of them today. The Earth formed around 4.5 billion years ago without oxygen by the accretion of the solar nebula. So later on, the human race has come there. That's what's causing all this problem. The evolution of life started with unicellular organism to the human species who contributed to the environmental degradation. He created the imbalance in the environmental uh, pollution beyond mother's nature ability clean up the mess, as a matter of fact. Restoring the climate change by decreasing the air pollution and global warming is essential to save the Mother Earth and is critical to the survival and flourishing of the humanity. As we all know that good health, we need clean air to breathe, good potable water to drink, and nutritious food to eat. Yes. And I uh, have a pleasure of welcoming our uh, Professor Jay Srinivasan. Ah. Sir, thank you, sir. Sorry, I was late. I have some problem joining. Thank yes, you. sir. With pleasure, sir. With pleasure, okay. sir. I'm just introducing the, uh, the theme I'm giving. Then you sure. can also have a welcome after this one, sir. And as our father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, said that the earth, the air, the land, and the water are not an inheritance from our forefathers, but a loan from our children. So we have to hand over to them, at least as it was handed over to us. To talk on these key issues and health environmental perspective, to have be, uh, behind the healthier, stronger society, for each of one of us, especially for our children, we have with the two eminent, one is a speaker, one the chairman, which I am going to introduce a little later. Before that, I have a pleasure welcoming Jay Srinivasan, the founder of the VHA Center, to formally to welcome this group. Yes, go ahead, sir. Please welcome, sir. Mr. Paramesh, on behalf of Professor Satish, chairman of the Center for Climate Change, I first thank Dr. Paramesh for organizing 
uh, seminar series related to uh, health issues. And it is very appropriate on 22nd April on Earth Day, we are having a seminar. And I thank you for it. And I request you to introduce the speaker. Yes, sir. I think to talk this subject, we have with us uh, the Purnima Prabhakaran. She is a physician graduated from Bangalore Medical College. Her master's in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a PhD in social medicine from University of Bristol, UK. Her doctoral work in Andhra Pradesh Children's and Parents Study brought to focus the importance of life course approach in the prevention and management of lifestyle and metabolic diseases. Currently, she's an additional professor, head environmental health and deputy director of the Center for Environmental Health at the Public Health Foundation of India, where she leads a team of nearly 20 researchers and consultants on research training, advocacy and capacity building for environmental health issues spanning air pollution, climate change, water, sanitation and hygiene, chemical and heavy metal exposures and children's environmental health. She is a member of the technical expert group providing inputs from the health perspective to various national programs related to the climate change, air pollution and urban resilience and heads for the Center for Excellence around the PHFI, providing an implementation framework to the national program of climate change and human health under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government for India. Additionally, she is a senior research scientist at the Center for Chronic Disease Control in New Delhi, and she is also leading consortium of the exposure scientist and health researcher to build a national model to expose to particulate matter and PM 2.5 to the health outcomes in India. Purnima chairs the research subcommittee for the WHO Civil Society Working Group in the climate change and health, and uh, and also we meet at least a couple of once a month, couple of months in WHO meeting. And to moderate this program, and also concluding remarks, the, we have chairing this session. We have none other than the founder of the, this organization, ComHealth. That is none other than Professor M. K. C. Nair, and he's a PhD, MD, and also emeritus professor of research and the formerly vice chancellor of Kerala United Health Sciences, and emeritus professor for developmental behavioral and adolescent pediatrics, Center for Disease Control, Kerala. And he was a PG teacher for 41 years, believe me. And also as a professor, he worked for 19 years. And he has a major research project completed over 16 of them. And he has to his credit 23 numbers of paper presented at international conferences, 168 numbers in national, international journals and medical textbooks. He's authored nearly about 19 in number, uh, four of them in the press. MPhil guided awarded about eight numbers it's, and also a chapter on textbook and medical 22 numbers, a PhD guided about eight numbers. He is the director and child development center Kerala from 1995 to 2014, the vice chancellor Kerala University Health Sciences from 2014 to 2019. And he has a, have about many awards as a matter for his accomplishment. 12 awards he received and 13 orations and about total of over 25 awards he received. A community activities most important his work, Lifetime Achievement Award from Indian Academy of Pediatrics, Indian Medical Association is a great honor. And he is the editor or chief of the National Indian Academy Textbook of Pediatrics. And it's a great honor having as a dear friend of mine. We share quite often. And thank you very much, sir. Sir, we are also having with us a great honor to welcome our national president, Yashwan Patil. And also, and now we have Vice Chancellor and uh, the Adi Chinchur University, Chandrasekhar Shetty, greatest ophthalmologist. So I think over to you, to MKC, please take over. Uh, unmute your mic, sir. For the program, you conduct the session. I will summarize it and make comments. 
Because you know the speaker much better than me. That's why I'm asking. You, you start with the meeting. I will, I will summarize and do the remarks in the end. Please lose. Okay. Dr. Paramesh? Yeah, over to Purnima. Go ahead, Purnima. Yeah. Introduce the speaker, and uh, let, after her speech, I will summarize everything. Yes, please. Okay, Purnima. It's all yours. <laughs> uh, namaste, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paramesh, and uh, the organizing team at Dwevecha Center for Climate Change, Comhad, and uh, Lakeside Education Trust. It's my humble privilege to be in the midst of our stalwarts like you, former teachers of mine from medical college, and uh, I'm really feeling humbled to be in the midst of this audience. Um, so let me share my slides here. Dr. Parmesh, is the presentation visible? Uh, well, some block is there. Visible. Sorry, am my slides visible? Uh, can the other people turn off their mic? Are it not visible? Please go ahead. So slides are visible? Yes, visible. Yes. So once again, uh, good evening, uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Patel. Thank you so much for joining us so early in your day from the US. It's my humble privilege to be uh, uh, presenting in this forum today. Uh, so uh, as Dr. Paramesh already outlined at the beginning, uh, the World Health Organization had at, as its theme for the World Health Day celebrated every year on April 7th, uh, building a fairer and healthier world. So when he gave me this topic for this conversation today, I was thinking uh, if this topic was given to different people, they would think about it differently. Uh, for example, um, educationist would think about it from the education angle. Uh, a businessman would think about it from the industrial focus. Um, uh, um, economist would think about it from an economist lens. But we are all mostly working within the health sector. So I thought we should certainly give this a health lens and the discussion today should center around uh, the conversation for building a fairer world from the health lens. So I we'll talk about the next uh, in the next uh, 30 40 30 40 minutes or so uh, on the public health priorities for india i thought that was the most uh, critical lens given the way we are all being engulfed by this evolving pandemic today there's nothing more important than the health lens in whatever discussions we are having so this is what i will focus on uh, my talk on today uh, and to do that, I mean, when we are talking about building a fairer and a healthier world, we can only do that if we understand what the landscape is today. So I will start by just getting us all on the same page by giving a snapshot of health and disease in India. Um, I know you were all no strangers, but I thought it would be good to just uh, re uh, refresh our memories on where we are today. I will then move on to some perspectives on public health priorities for India. And I will share with you uh, the work from Public Health Foundation of India and our journey of work for addressing public health issues in India. And this is simply because we all need to take our own little baby steps to address the issue of building a healthier and a fairer world. So I thought it might be pertinent to share a little bit of what we have done in that space, just as an example of what is possible and what should be amplified and escalated in the years and months to come. So a snapshot of some of India's demographic and health indicators. We are a very populous country. We have 382 persons per square kilometer area in our country. If we look at the male to female ratio, we have 943 females for every thousand male babies born. 
Life expectancy today on an average is something close to 70 years, 68.7 years to be precise. Maternal mortality ratio, which is the number of mothers who are dying during pregnancy, during uh, delivery, is 130 per 1 lakh live births. Our infant mortality rate, uh, it's no news to this audience, a lot of pediatricians I, I can see in the audience, is 34 per 1,000 live births, and that is a very grim statistic. Our population bed ratio, I think this rings true very much today when we are seeing how our public health infrastructure has crumbled in the midst of this pandemic. The figure for India is half a bed for 1,000 population. So you can see where we started from and why we are in this chaos today. Public hospitals bed strength is a little over 7 lakhs. Private hospitals bed strength uh, about uh, 11 lakhs and totally about 18 lakhs or 19 lakhs almost beds for this whole population. Allopathic doctors, we have one per 11,000. And this statistic is what should worry all of us. The budget allocation for health for such a populous country with these health indicators is 1.3% of our GDP. And we have been hoping for the last few years that it will at least be increased to 2.5%. This year, budget 2021 saw an increase of 137% for the health budget, but mostly that was for the coverage of COVID vaccine. This should give us a start to where we are heading from here. Just to talk a little bit about how the life expectancy in India has changed. We are talking about a 30, uh, 40 years range, 1970s. Our life expectancy ranged anywhere from 45 to 55 years of age. Over the last three decades, we have reached somewhere around uh, 70 years of age, and this is for rural and urban. Somewhere between 65 to 70 years of age is the average number of life years uh, an Indian will spend on this earth. What quality of life are we living for those 70 years? I want to linger a little bit on the current COVID-19 statistics. As per the information from the, our Ministry of Health and Family Welfare till yesterday, these are the statistics from 21st April 2021. We have a total of, uh, I think, 1 crore 59 lakhs. Daily cases have crossed 3 lakhs. We are topping the table in the entire world in the number of COVID cases we are having. Recovery rate is about uh, 1 crore and 34 lakhs, which is about 84% we are seeing a death rate of one point, nearly 1.2%. And the case fatality ratio, that is the number of deaths that are occurring from COVID in relation to the number of deaths and the number of people recovered is not looking good. It's about 1.35%. And they, we talk about the denominator, our population is huge, so it's okay. But we know that every life matters in every family that is suffering today. Vaccination coverage is steadily increasing pan-India. And we know that India has distributed COVID-19 vaccine to over 15 countries. I don't have the entire list out here, but we have distributed in the in the vaccine friendship to a number of neighboring countries, and rightly so. Uh, we we started off right, but what is happening today is a different story altogether. We are seeing a sharp upsurge in COVID-19 cases. We are something hovering around 12 percent, and this is this is the kind of uh, uh, peak that we had. We increased last year somewhere around July, August, September, came down. We thought we were at the end of it. And here is this exponential increase in cases that we are seeing um, in April 2021. We just fearing getting up every day and listening to which family has been affected next. So it's a very sobering scenario and we have to think, rethink our reshaping or, of our public health infrastructure. So what is the definition of health? I'd like to remind ourselves the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. It is not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We talk about healthy living, balanced diet, avoid stress, reduce overweight, uh, exercise, healthy food. But also it has become all the more permanent, pertinent today in this uh, scenario that we have been facing from last year that we also have to think about the social well-being. Livelihoods are so important. And for all of that, health seems to be the fulcrum, the central focus of all the conversations that need to happen. So what is known about health and healthcare of Indians? 
we have a relatively lower life expectancy with wide variations in different parts of our country, rural to urban. We have a strong predilection to conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease and certain forms of cancer. Research is not in sync with our disease burden needs. So unless we know what is happening, research it, we were not going to take appropriate action. So a lot of times our policies in the country at national and subnational level are not aligned with the needs because there is not enough evidence to build our policies on. There are lots of emerging problems, air pollution, water pollution with heavy metals, deforestation, one of the prime reasons why we are seeing the pandemic we are seeing today. There's blurring of ecosystems. We are the land use degradation that happens and causing species to jump from one like the animal to the human species is what was responsible for the pandemic we are seeing today. So these are emerging problems. Last but not the least, we unfortunately have quite a chaotic health system. There's a high maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate. We have a high rising burden of non-communicable diseases. I'm going to focus a lot of my talk on that. And we have emerging and re-emerging zoonotic diseases. So this is a snapshot of what is the health status of Indians today. And I want to linger on this slide for a bit just to show you if you compare from 1990, this is the stable of risk factors for disease for both genders and all ages. And if you see in 1990, the major problems that were centered around uh, in terms of health problems were around child and maternal malnutrition, unsafe water sanitation and hand washing, air pollution was already climbing the table, dietary risks, tobacco, blood pressure. And if we go fast forward to 2016, we still have quite a few of these, but air pollution is steadily rising on the table there, apart from blood pressure, because it is related to so many different diseases as a risk factor. So I wanted to talk about what has been happening in India. It is a, it is a situation that is happening in very many countries. What we are seeing is an epidemiological transition. And what is that? Epidemiological transition is referring to a change in the pattern of disease in a country away from infectious diseases to more degenerative diseases. And this was a term coined in 1970s by somebody, uh, a scientist called Omran, and it focuses on the complex change in patterns of health and disease. And this is important for all of us as researchers, as academics, as clinicians to understand that there is a changing pattern in diseases. And mostly, most countries will go through these four stages of earliest of which would have been pestilence, which is infectious diseases, maybe famine, and then a stage of receding pandemics, moving on to degenerative and man-made diseases in stage three, and then stage four, where we are seeing more delayed degenerative diseases, maybe things like arthritis and elderly geriatric conditions, for example, as we increase our uh, older age groups because of increased life expectancy. Just a snapshot here of these four stages. What really happens? I'm giving you this as an example, as an example, heart disease, cardiovascular disease. When you're in stage one, when it's only infections and stuff, the life expectancy was very less. People used to die younger. But by the time we have reached here, we are India is somewhere now here between stage three and three, four. Our life expectancy is close to 70 years. Dominant diseases are more chronic midlife conditions and you know, chronic diseases. From infections, we have moved more and more to the chronic diseases. Even if you take just the heart disease, earlier it used to be rheumatic heart disease. The pediatricians here will recognize rheumatic heart disease, nutritional heart disease. But now we are seeing with our older ages, ages we are seeing more of heart disease and stroke. And earlier it used to be higher classes that used to be affected. Now across the socioeconomic status, these conditions are seen across all classes of society. What is the transition in terms of the countries usually? From less developed, we are moving to developed. From an agrarian economy, which is largely agricultural, India is still considered an agricultural economy. 16, 18% of our GDP comes from our agricultural work. But we are also slowly transitioning, um, actually not slowly, India has actually rapidly transitioned to an industrialized economy. We are moving from pre-modern to modern and our care also from primitive forms of healthcare, we are moving to modernized healthcare. What was the time frame of this transition in India? Let us compare ourselves to industrialized countries. Industrialized countries took a long time to go through these four phases. 
In India, we did this very quickly. It was a very compressed time frame, which saw us move from stage one to stage three or four. And we have a huge double burden of disease. We are urbanizing in a very rapid manner and we have very limited resources. It is certainly a grim scenario. And this is a snapshot of our country showing the ratio of communicable diseases, infections to non-communicable diseases. So earlier, this is the ratio if you see was higher to communicable diseases. Fast forward to 2016, 30 years later, we have more of heart disease, stroke, chronic pulmonary disease, mental health, cancers. These are the conditions that our health system is dealing with today. So I was thinking about what are these transitions India has had over the decades. One is certainly the demographic transition. I was talking about our life expectancy having moved. We now have more of elderly population. We have seen the epidemiological transition in terms of our disease patterns. We also have seen a nutritional transition. The way we eat, it's not like what it was 30, 40 years ago. More of processed foods and our, our lifestyles have changed a lot. I definitely, as a person working now in the environmental health space, I'm cognizant of an environmental transition. Our air quality is deteriorating, our water bodies are getting more and more contaminated. Climate change is becoming an increasing problem. So there is an environmental transition. All of this happening in India. What, we, what I think we need is a thought transition. 2020 has laid bare the conditions in India so far as all of these transitions are concerned. And I think we certainly need to move to health and healthcare at the core of all our discussions. So a thought transition for everybody, not just us as clinicians and academicians and researchers. I think even the policy think tanks and at the highest level have to bring health at the core of all decision making. And that is what I will advocate for. And, and, and I'm sure all of us over here think the same. But is that easy? It's easier said than done. What are we dealing with over here in India? Just talking about the public health infrastructure. We have multiple systems of medicine, mixed ownership patterns, and different kinds of delivery structures. This is the Indian healthcare sector. This is just a snapshot of what the Indian healthcare sector. We are all familiar with this, but this graphic helps us to actually face reality. We have the private healthcare system on this side, for-profit, non-profit, multi-speciality hospitals, nursing homes, private clinics, charitable dispensaries, NGO-run clinics. On the other side, the public health system under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, you have tertiary care hospitals like AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, medical colleges, their hospitals, CGHS dispensaries, down to the district level hospitals, community health centers, primary health centers, sub centers, which are now being mooted as uh, the, clinics, the centers for the Ayushman Bharat program, uh, which will be these sub centers will be converted into health and wellness centers. And on the other side, the state hospitals, municipal corporation dispensaries, ESI hospitals, Ayush dispensaries. And at the front line, we have our ASHA workers and the Anganwadi centers at the village level. We have ministries of defense that have their own base hospitals. We have ministry of railways. So if we are talking of refurbishing all of these uh, health facilities, it's a huge task. But decisions have to be made and, and the right decisions have to be made. So coming back to the public health priorities for India, I want us to focus on what is most problematic today. We have with us a double burden of disease. We have non-communicable diseases, which includes heart disease, other lifestyle disorders, chronic respiratory disease, cancers, and mental health. So this is the group that is non-communicable diseases. We continue to be plagued by communicable diseases. We are not out of this phase of infections and nutritional disorders, as well as new and emerging epidemics and pandemics. We also have to face now environmental risk factors, air pollution, climate change, water sanitation, chemical toxins and heavy metals in our water. And of course, an in health infrastructure and a very capable and efficient health workforce is what we need. So how do we deal, of, we deal with all of this? What are the solutions? I think we definitely need to focus on research. There's lots of work that can be done in this space, in clinical level, in population level. The research enterprise in India certainly needs a stimulus. We need to strengthen that space simply because oftentimes our policymakers are saying we can't make policies on data that is coming from the Western world. So we need to do research that is contextualized to our country. We need to have surveillance. We um, 
surveillance to continuously monitor what our disease patterns are and and transition to the use of low cost solutions as well as harness technology. We are increasingly becoming a technocratic world, so we need to harness that uh, power of technology. We cannot forget traditional approaches. Yoga. Yoga is now being advocated even for cardiac rehabilitation. It is an age old um, uh, thing that we have in our country and should certainly be leveraged. Uh, innovations, telemedicine, we have seen in the last year and a half how we have been transitioning to telemedicine because these are the new frontiers. If we cannot go and access healthcare in a situation like the pandemic today, the, the next port of call was to use digital uh, medicine and transition to telemedicine. We have to address also special groups, vulnerable groups. If our age pyramid is changing, it means that we have more and more elderly people to take care of and our policies are not really mapping onto those needs. We also need to think of a life course approach. This is important right from the time of pregnancy, um, like exposure of pregnant women to different adverse risk factors has an impact on the child lifelong. And this is a concept uh, which is called the developmental origins of health and disease, the DOHAD paradigm. If we don't focus on this, we are actually setting then generation after generation for poor disease outcomes. At the core of it all, we need to build our capacities, enhance our human resource capacity through a variety of training programs. This is important, continuing medical education, building our capacities at every level. So at this point, I thought I'll just introduce the Public Health Foundation of India, which was set up to strengthen India's public health. There was never a public health cadre in our health system. We have clinicians, we might have clinicians who do research, but a public health cadre was not there. And that was the vision with which the Public Health Foundation was set up in 2006 by actually a cardiologist, the president uh, till today actually is Professor Srinath Reddy. He was head of cardiology in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And PHFI was set up with a mandate uh, of developing this public health workforce for the country, strengthen knowledge application and evidence informed public health practice and policy and to advance public health research. And we recognized right at the outset that public health rec involves a number of different allied disciplines. It includes clinical uh, science, it includes epidemiology, humanity, social sciences, you need a social lens to everything, economics, environmental life sciences. And we need at the core of it all to translate all that work we do to the government, to academia, spread the knowledge, engage with civil society organizations as well as with industry leaders. So PHFI represents a partnership for public purpose and our, our vision has been to establish Indian Institutes of Public Health on the lines of Indian Institutes of Management and Indian Institutes of Technology. We have four, one in Gandhinagar, Delhi, uh, Hyderabad, in Bhubaneswar and in Shillong, in addition to numbers, uh, number of centers of excellence that deal with particular disease conditions, chronic conditions, uh, social determinants of health, disability, environmental health, which I lead, and most recently recognizing the need uh, for digital health. The Center for Digital Health was also established uh, at the latter part of 2020. So, we our research areas span a number of uh, uh, domains. I'm not going to read all of this, but just to show that research is a big core requirement in India, and we try to do our little bit in that space. Capacity building is another piece that I was mentioning. We need to continuously keep ourselves abreast of uh, continuing um, uh, medical knowledge that comes out. And through to that end, we have a lot of training programs where we train not just the you know, doctors at uh, at uh, higher levels, but mostly the primary care physicians who are working at the lower levels of the healthcare uh, facilities in our healthcare system, giving them continuing education on a number of different uh, aspects of healthcare. So coming back to this uh, public health priorities, I will focus the rest of my talk on non-communicable diseases uh, simply because it is our development dilemma. NCDs in India is the major problem that we are facing and, and, and is costing our health system a lot of money. Why? Because it's affecting younger and younger people in our country. About 60% of the deaths are occurring below 70 years of age from non-communicable diseases, 40% below 65 years of age. It's costing India a lot of economic losses, close to $5 trillion between 2011 and 2030 is the estimate. And, and we have as Indians been 
uh, showing a special predilection for cardiovascular disease, some forms of cancer, and to certain risk factors. It is, it is indigenous, like oral tobacco, indoor air pollution because of our cooking practices. Diabetes, we were known not so long ago as the diabetes capital of the world. And we also see a lot of migration, rural to urban migrants. So sibling comparison studies where you compare people who have moved to the cities, they tend to acquire the risk factors compared to their siblings who stay back in the villages. And that is what is increasing the burden of non-communicable diseases. And there's progressively more and more uh, so lower socioeconomic status people also being afflicted by non-communicable diseases. So according to the UN declaration in 2018, the big five uh, non-communicable diseases are cardiovascular diseases, cancer, respiratory diseases, diabetes mellitus, and mental health conditions. And all of us know that at least one of these conditions has touched at least one of our close family members, if not more. And the five main risk factors are tobacco, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption, and newest risk factor that has been added to these top five is air pollution. Apart from these five major risk uh, the diseases, the other chronic diseases are also there. We should not forget things like cirrhosis, kidney disease, oral health, eye health. But the biggest ones are these five major risk factors. And what we are looking at here is these things like sedentary uh, lifestyles that we are all following now and air pollution. We call it as the new tobacco. When we were back in medical school, we never learned about air pollution. We learned about tobacco as a risk factor for pulmonary disease. Nobody talked about air pollution. So we have to also change medical curriculum now to bring this new tobacco into the curriculum and teach our medical students. So a lot of factors determine these risk factors. It's not just our genetics, our biology. It's also our cultural practices, our beliefs and behaviors. And it's also influenced by global policies. So about cardiovascular diseases, what does it do? It affects very many systems in our body. It affects the heart for sure. It's causing strokes when it affects the brain. It affects peripheral vascular, uh, it, our blood vessels causing peripheral vascular disease. Diabetes, which is one of the major risk factors resulting in things like gangrene. And we are all increasingly seeing overweight and obesity. So it's the leading cause of death. So I want to uh, focus the rest of the talk on focus on one problem, like how do we build a healthier world? If we pick up this one problem of cardiovascular diseases and one risk factor for that, which is hypertension, I will walk you through a journey that we have done from research to translation to practice about how to address this one problem, which can make a lot of change for the health system and the burden that we are having today on the health system. About hypertension, which is high blood pressure, it is a disease of three paradoxes. It's very unfortunate. It's, it's very easily detectable. We can very easily record a blood pressure of a, an individual. But unfortunately, the diagnosis rates are very dismal. Once it's diagnosed, it's not treated easily because of people uh, not complying to the treatment uh, to the full extent. And even though several drugs are available, control rates of hypertension across India are pretty poor. And the established causes for high blood pressure are high sodium intake, low fruit and vegetable intake, alcohol consumption, overweight and obesity, and low physical activity. And all of us will identify with these risk factors. It is rampant in every household. And, and we have to just reverse this to just reverse the occurrence of hypertension in our country. It includes lifestyle change. The solution is include lifestyle change, drugs, as well as policy interventions. Along with that, a lot of upstream determinants that we are seeing today. I told uh, you a short while ago, air pollution. It is now recognized by the United Nations uh, that air pollution is one of the top risk factors for non-communicable diseases. There's also relation to noise pollution. Maybe it's the stress relation to green spaces as well as to water pollution. The question is, do we have evidence? Oftentimes we engage with a lot of the policymakers, and the question is, where is the evidence? You're telling us research that has happened in the Western world. Where is the evidence in India? So I'm just walking you through some examples. These are not published results, but just to show a GIS, a geographic spatial mapping of a, of a location in Delhi, city of Delhi, where I live. Uh, high traffic density is where high traffic junctions has been shown to be associated with high blood pressure. 
nearness to green spaces. If you're living near green spaces, near parks, uh, you have less tendency to have high blood pressure. These are all just small pieces of research that are coming out. Low physical activity is related to high blood pressure. What about air pollution? So this is the newest risk factor. Do we have evidence? Is air pollution related to blood pressure? So nobody could uh, you know, find that evidence, at least in India before. So why are we focusing on air pollution? It is a risk factor that is an upstream determinant related to blood pressure. And that is why I want to focus on this risk factor for the next few minutes. So if we look at air pollution, this is headlines from research in 2017. And on an average, every Indian is exposed to something like 19, 90 micrograms per meter cubed of this particulate matter, PM 2.5, which uh, Dr. Pramesh had also mentioned before. It is two, two times, two and a half times greater, this value, than the national ambient air quality standards we have in India, which is 40. The air quality in India should not be more than 40 according to our national guidelines. WHO's guideline is 10. So average Indian is exposed to 90 micrograms. It is it is really high. And much, many parts of India, like Indo-Gangetic Plain, have the highest exposure. A lot of our population is still using solid fuels. 50% of our population still cooks with biomass, with cow dung, with, with, uh, uh, with uh, agricultural residue. And that household air pollution caused by this is responsible for a lot of um, uh, illness in our country. And the statistic is 1.2 million deaths attributable to air pollution, 0.6 from outdoor air pollution and about 0.5 from household air pollution. And many of the deaths are occurring in younger age groups, less than 70 years of age, and an average of 1.7 years of life are lost due to air pollution in India. This is coming out from recent research. A map of India showing our districts if we go, like I told you, by the WHO guidelines of 10 micrograms, 99% of Indian districts are above the guidelines. If we go by our own national ambient air quality standards, 60% of Indian districts are having poor air quality. And we see seasonal variation. This is a picture during monsoon and uh, during winter. In winter, this is how Gurgaon looks, where I live in the national capital region. Um, and this is a picture from Indo-Gangetic Plain, uh, where the winters see very, very uh, dense uh, fog and poor, poor air quality. This is also a picture of India showing the household air pollution levels. 24 hour average kitchen levels of pollution across the country. A big part of India is seeing poor indoor air quality due to the use of um, biomass for cooking. We are still using unclean cooking fuels for um, cooking. So what can we do? We have to understand why, where are these pollutants coming from? Why is our air quality so poor? A lot of it comes from industrial uh, sources. India as a country still relies on uh, coal-fired thermal power plants for our electricity. 70% of our electricity comes from thermal power plants like this, which are spewing air pollutants every day. It, uh, it is it is very um, intuitive to un uh, to think India is a solar uh, solar rich country. We have 42 solar parks in our country. Why are we not transitioning to renewable energies for generating our electricity? So one of the major things that we have to do is scale down this combustion of fossil fuels, coal, in our power plants to generate electricity. Traffic. Um, and industrial sources are a big uh, part of air pollution. And I just uh, wanted to show here what we talked about, this particulate matter 2.5. Why is it important from the health point of view? This is a human hair follicle, and it has a size, a dimension of 50 to 70 microns. Compare that to PM 2.5. It's only 2.5 uh, microns. Um, so, which is why we are concerned about this particulate matter in the air, because we are inhaling this very easily, and that's why it's reaching the lungs and other parts of the body through the circulatory system. It is very, very tiny in size, and our air is full of these PM 2.5 particles. The bigger particles are the PM 10, and uh, they include the dust, the pollen, and the mold. So the sources of all of these uh, particulate matter come from vehicles. I talked about power plants, our waste. 
every day we are increasing the mounds of heap from our waste generation. We also are subject to forest fires and volcanoes and these natural calamities which are worsening our air quality. Indoor cooking fuels, I won't go through the details, but using cooking fuels, our children are often seen doing these things in rural households. So open fire cooking stoves produces heavy smoke, which has a lot of harmful uh, particles. And again, all of these are related air pollution causing these uh, risk factors and these conditions for life, affecting the heart, the brain and um, you know different parts of our body. Um, this is just to show the mechanisms of how air pollution is increasing cardiovascular disease. For those who are interested, the pathway is very, very molecular. At the lowest level, particulate matter, when it reaches the circulatory system, it is causing endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory reactions that lead to increased blood pressure. That is the pathway that is happening and leading to all these non-communicable diseases that we are seeing today. The question that is being asked by all our ministries and ministries of environment and health, where is the evidence in India for the health effects of air pollution? Thankfully, so we have a lot of people who have started looking at it. Dr. Parmesh himself has been involved in a lot of air pollution research in the pediatric population. People have started looking at pregnant mothers and birth outcomes. We are seeing now that pregnant mothers who are exposed to air poor air quality have children with lower birth weight they are prone to having stillbirths, premature births, and even after birth, these children are prone to poor growth and development as well as poor cognitive outcome. The research is coming out even from India on these adverse birth and childhood outcomes. Of course, there are studies linking adult exposure to air quality and respiratory health. A lot of cross-sectional studies have been established by the Ministry of Health to see that there is increased number of cases of respiratory infections in our emergency wards in winter. Uh, what about studies in India? Is there ex solid evidence in India linking air pollution to cardiovascular disease to help us give to the policymakers that this is important and that's why you need to probably phase out fossil fuels. You probably have to change the way people are cooking using unclean cooking fuels. Where is the evidence was the question and that is where uh, we did a little bit of research over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, this was a cardiometabolic risk reduction study for South Asia, which was established by our group here in CCD, our Center for Chronic Disease Control and PHFI with AIMS and Emory University and Madras Diabetes Research Foundation. We picked two cities, Delhi and Chennai, and followed up 8,000 adult uh, uh, citizens from 2010. Um, I, for interest of time, I will not go into the details of how we did this, but just in the sake of Delhi, we picked our population from all across Delhi, 8,000 people. And what we did was from 2010 to 20 to date, we are following up these 8,000 adults also in Chennai and looking at their various cardiometabolic risk factors, recording their heights, weights, how are they moving in the obesity, uh, towards obesity, uh, their blood pressures, we are doing their blood work to see their sugars, how are their fasting glucose, how are their postprandial glucose, and a lot of these different tests. So 8,000 people in Delhi, 8,000 people in Chennai, we had a huge population that has been followed up. How could we establish the link with air pollution for all of these people? And we were fortunate to receive some funding from the NIH in US, uh, along with the Harvard School of Public Health, to establish this Geo Health Hub, uh, a program to uh, connect air pollution to cardiovascular disease. And what we did was we used all, obviously we couldn't go back 10 years and start understanding what were these people exposed to poor air quality. So the best way to do this was to do, use a modeling approach. And for this model, we use data from very many sources. We all are aware of our state pollution control boards who set up monitoring stations to record air quality. We also used satellite data. We used something called emission inventories. We used weather data and we used a lot of land use data to build this model for air pollution for the last 10 years for Delhi and Chennai. And uh, without getting into the details, I just want to show you what was the end product. If you see here, you can see this is a live uh, figure. Every month from uh, January to December, from the year 2010 to 
to 2016, we are uh, we are uh, refreshing the model up to 2020. We were able to show the air pollution levels for the last 10 years, and you can see as we approach the winter months, the 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 figures get red because it is during the winter months that the air quality gets low. So this helped us understand the air quality PM 2.5 levels over the last 10 years in Delhi and Chennai. And using these air quality uh, data, we were able to relate it to our population's blood pressure. And that is what we had started out to do. And we found that there was certainly a link. We used about 3000 households and uh, looked at the question, is air pollution related to blood pressure and sure enough we found that for every 25 micrograms increase in the pm 2.5 blood pressure was increasing by somewhere to, from three to five millimeters of mercury this might seem like a small figure but just think about it for ourselves when we rec record our blood pressure systolic especially diastolic if it is increasing by three to five millimeters of mercury for every 25 micrograms and I was telling you how high our air uh, uh, pollution uh, level is. It means how many more people are reaching our health systems, are reaching our doctors. They need to get their blood pressure under control. They need, they are burdening our health systems because if this blood pressure is not controlled, they are going to then end up in non-communicable disease like cardiovascular disease. So that is the relation that I wanted to establish and show you what our group has done to show that yes, there is a relation and yes, we need to address our air pollution uh, issues in India and we need to make policies that can address that problem. Um, so I will go through these slides quickly. This is just to show data from those studies, but I uh, want to highlight how we are now able to show air pollution relation to not just blood pressure. We are also showing the relation to fasting glucose to HbA1c. Most of you are familiar that shows glucose control. And what is it doing in terms of individual individuals? That is a population level analysis. We also try to understand in our uh, in our study, what is it doing to individuals? Is it different at individual level? And this is a small study we did in 100 people just to understand are individuals being exposed also on a daily basis to different levels of air pollution. So we picked 100 people coming from very, very different occupations in Delhi. Uh, drivers, carpenters, electronics, um, uh, technician, households, domestic maids, a lot of different people. And what we did was they carried in a, their backpack an air quality monitor for 24 hours and we were able to map their air pollution levels for the 24 hours. And we could see that the spikes used to happen when they were traveling, when they are cooking. And this helped us even further consolidate the evidence of exposure to poor air quality during the day. So this is an example of a husband and a wife. The husband is a driver, the household, uh, the door, she's a housewife. And the difference within the household, she is cooking during the day and her air quality exposure is much, much more than her husband who is actually commuting for some part of the day. So these are little uh, pieces of research that help us feed into the policy making for the uh, for the uh, country and i wanted to move on now to innovations in care we are talking about building a healthier world a fairer world what should we do to bring healthcare to people who are not accessing it the way they should be accessing so a little bit about what uh, can be done we have to move to harness technology can we move to task shifting? Why should a, a blood pressure measurement have to be done only by a doctor? Can we move to different cadres of healthcare? Can nurses do it? Can other people be trained to record blood pressure? This can also address our human resources shortage. And that's why we talk about new frontiers for the future in the form of digital health. And digital health is not just um, telemedicine that I talked about, but also harnessing the power of um, mobile health. We know in our country, even if people don't have food, they have a mobile phone. So why not we harness mobile uh, technology to deliver care to people for controlling their blood pressures? And without going into the details here, I wanted to just uh, tell you that in PHFI, we also tried to do research over the last few years to see how mobile technology can be harnessed 
as a decision support system to not just doctors, but also to nurses and other care practitioners to just do the simple thing of screening people when they walk into a clinic for their blood pressure, how much it can translate into reducing the burden on our healthcare system. So our aim was to help the patient, the provider, as well as the health system. So I'm not going into the details. The side, slides can be shared later, but just, just to share that harnessing digital health and mobile technology is an important step towards uh, you know, uh, reducing workload for our healthcare system, but also at the same time controlling our uh, the levels of hypertension in our population. And it can be done for other parts of healthcare as well. And this was just our journey, the five years of research about how to translate just the simple recording of blood pressure. We have now been able to translate a decision support system on a mobile platform, which has been scaled up across states and um, at the national level. Uh, uh, it harnesses things like using mobile phones, 3D imaging, and also point of care devices. We also need to sometimes see how we can reach even the remote parts of our country with these devices. And for that, we have used a screening device which one can carry in their backpack and go and do at least 30 blood tests um, even in a remote location. So these are the kinds of disruptive technology and innovations that can probably bridge the gap between those who need health care and those who are able to provide that care. And uh, a, a, a minute on this innovative way, way of care that we thought about very recently when during the pandemic, a lot of people were not able to access usual health care. They were not able to get to the hospitals. And we talked a lot about telemedicine, but how many of us are able to access a laptop or a phone to even access telemedicine? So this is an assisted telemedicine solution that we thought of. And what we did was to bridge the need between a community in need and the specialist doctors. And what that did was actually we set up these centers in urban slums where there was just one nurse, one doctor, one laboratory technician who was able to reach out to the community who walked into that clinic, help them go through some basic medical care, record their blood pressure, record, do some basic blood tests for them and right there, connect them through telemedicine to specialists. So in one visit, they are able to access health care uh, and in one stop. So this is an assisted telemedicine solution that we thought might be helpful for people in remote locations who are not able to access specialist care. Shifting gears for the last part of my talk to environmental risk factors, because that is what uh, is my bread and butter now and is very, very important as a risk factor now for our health problems and lingering only on few things, climate change and water related disorders, chemicals and nutritional disorders. So climate change, as you all will hear today, actually is a big important day for the climate change activists and advocates and re re researchers because uh, the US, as we all would have heard from the news, has transitioned from not supporting climate change to today. The president of US is holding the summit, Biden summit, where he's called 40 national health leaders to discuss climate change. I think the meeting would have just started and they are going to address the issue of climate change and how it is impacting the most vulnerable of our countries in very many ways. Heat waves, vector borne diseases, worsening air quality, as well as impacting agriculture and nutrition security and waterborne diseases. And just to um, uh, show you a statistic from India, 40 million additional heat wave exposure events occurred in India in 2016. And mostly they were our elderly population as well as our agricultural laborers who have to be outside. And they were exposed to huge uh, number of exposure events. And the temperature is continuing to increase in India. In very many metro cities, we are seeing the intensity of heat is increasing. We are again at the brink of another heat wave uh, where we live in Delhi, in Bhopal, in different countries. Temperatures in the last few years have increased on an average by anywhere from four to six degrees. And this is a report from the World Bank which showed that the negative impact is going to worst, um, affect worst uh, uh, le uh, the uh, Indian Indian um, diaspora because we are the most vulnerable in terms of heat. And uh, just to linger on the heat effects, 
uh, or many of you are physicians and clinicians, your heat effects on health vary from heat exhaustion, heat stroke, cerebrovascular events, circulatory failure, renal failure, and exacerbation of pulmonary disease. And mostly the extremes of age, infants and young children are especially vulnerable apart from the elderly. Uh, climate change is also affecting our vector-borne disease patterns. So dengue, chikungunya, malaria, Japanese encephalitis. India is a hotspot. As one of the countries most vulnerable to climate change, we are seeing a changing pattern of vector-borne diseases. These diseases are moving to parts of our country, Northeast, Himachal Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, countries, uh, states that have never seen these diseases are now change, uh, seeing the climatic suitability to these vector-borne diseases. And so they are occurring increasingly in all these states as well. Water. We are a water-stressed country. 70% of our surface waters unfortunately contaminated. And among 122 countries on water quality index, we stand at 120. It is not looking good in terms of water as well. And also with that little water also, it is one of the main reasons waterborne diseases, unsafe water and poor sanitation is seen in very many parts of our country contributing to uh, disease burden, diarrhea, lots of diarrheal disease that still occurs among our children. Uh, again, our rivers are contaminated with heavy metals. That is another sobering situation. We are seeing things like heavy metals like fluoride and arsenic. And these are heavy metals that cause very many uh, you know, conditions like arsenic, for example, is seen in lots of water bodies in West Bengal, in Assam, in Bihar, in Patna. And these regions are seeing more and more skin conditions, cancer risk. Fluorosis is seen uh, in many parts of our country as well. These are all water related um, contamination. We are also known as the pharmacy of the world. India produces a lot of pharmaceutical ingredients and our pharmaceutical manufacturing units probably are also responsible for water effluence into our water bodies. And increasingly, uh, this might be of importance, uh, relevance to people here in Karnataka about uh, Kaveri River, E. coli isolates 100% were resistant to the third generation cephalosporin. This is another issue which often gets left out, the water contamination in our water bodies. We have limited water, but the, if those water bodies are contaminated, it's huge cause for concern. Um, on the nutrition impacts, uh, climate change is also because of the high temperatures that we are seeing. What is happening is it's affecting our agricultural production. So our rice, our wheat, soya bean, maize, staple crops, the growth, uh, the crop production is decreasing and it's also decreasing in terms of its nutrient content. So iron, zinc, um, micronutrients content in all our staple crops is also decreasing as a result of changing climate, increasing temperatures basically. So lastly, I want to talk about why should our health sector be affected by climate change? So we were grappling a, a short while ago about the fact that air pollution is not known to our medical curriculum and our medical students need to be told about air pollution. But also we need to think about climate change. What is linking climate change with healthcare? We just, I just showed you in the last few slides how climate change is impacting health. There are very many impacts on health as a result of the changing climate. The heat waves, floods, droughts, all uh, increasing sea levels, all of these uh, mean that there's going to be a growing dependence on healthcare services. And so our healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses need to be very familiar with what is going to happen. It's an impending disaster, uh, the impacts of climate change on health. Therefore, we need to enhance our knowledge as well as our infrastructure to handle this growing burden of diseases. Question is, are we prepared? I wanted to talk about the fact that climate change is not just affecting India. So these are grim scenarios we are seeing from, this is Chennai, India, when floods occurred in December 2015. This was a hospital in Thambaram, where are, because the floodwaters reached the hospital, there were uh, patients who had to be moved out on an emergency basis to other facilities. It's not just in India, but also this is Puerto Rico, similar scene. Hurricane Maria that affected Puerto Rico in 2017. So also in uh, California, wildfires, which is another impact of climate change. Again, patients having to be moved out. 
So really, climate change is an equalizer. It doesn't affect only developed countries or only developing countries, but the level of impact is different. And India is certainly among the most vulnerable of the countries. So what do we need to build our own climate resilience? We talk about six building blocks. This is again from WHO. We need leadership and governance. We need a good, uh, well-capacitated uh, health for workforce. We need good health information systems. We need essential medical products and technologies, service delivery, and financing for preparing our health systems for this. And this all uh, banks on the Paris Agreement, which some of you might be aware of, which was in 2015, uh, argument, uh, uh, an agreement that was articulated for all countries to subscribe to and prepare themselves for climate change impacts. And that is when um, uh, this concept of climate smart healthcare, I don't know if any of you have heard of this concept, but this is a concept that we are strongly advocating to become climate smart in our healthcare. And this is a report that came out in uh, 2017 by the World Bank, the need for low carbon and resilient strategies for our healthcare. So certainly we are all trained as clinicians to deliver healthcare, but we also need to deliver that healthcare in a very uh, smart way. And that is the concept of climate smart healthcare that we as a center of excellence in the Public Health Foundation of India for the National Program for Climate Change and Human Health are talking about to the government, uh, to the Ministry of Health. The concept of climate smart healthcare has two pillars. One is resilience, which is really preparing our health system uh, about uh, dealing with climate change. The other one is mitigation. That is, this concept seems uh, very paradoxical to people uh, when we say that health sector is also responsible for emissions, greenhouse gases, which increase the temperature and cause climate change. It is because every activity of ours, including that of the health sector, when we deliver healthcare, we do a lot of things. We use energy, we use water, we use uh, food, we, del we produce waste. All of these are responsible for our climate footprint. And so this aspect of decarbonizing our healthcare operations is also an important vertical that we need to talk about. And healthcare workers are first responders. When acute climatic events, whether it's floods, droughts, heat waves, whatever we talk about, we are first responders. The people, the community looks up to is the healthcare system. And we should be the last building standing, but not just standing, but also functioning and providing uninterrupted care. Are we able to do that? We saw those very disturbing visuals of what happened in the situation of a flood in Chennai. Those kind of things should not be happening. We need to build our public health infrastructure to also be able to deal with these acute impacts of climatic events. And that is the concept of resilience, which WHO has defined as a climate resilient health system is one that is capable of anticipating, responding to, coping with and recovering from and adapting, adapting to such climate related shocks and stress so as to bring sustained and continued health care to our communities. The other concept is about greening our blue. So blue usually represents the color of our health system. So we need to green that blue. And what that means really is what I was talking about a two, couple of minutes ago, reduce our emissions. So healthcare footprint apparently is something like 5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And it is equivalent to emissions from something like 500 coal-fired power plants. And if we put all the hospitals in the world together and rank it along with countries, I believe the healthcare sector would be the fifth largest emitter on the planet. That's a very staggering statistic and which gives us the responsibility to act. And that is why we are required to think about how we are delivering our health care and reducing our own footprint. So I just wanted to bring this concept because this is a concept which is new to a lot of people in the healthcare sector itself, that the concept of climate smart healthcare is really very, very important for us to recognize. And together, these two concepts of resilience and mitigation uh, constitutes the climate smart health system. So I'll close now with my takeaway messages. I'm, I apologize if I've taken away too much time, but changing disease pro profile for India uh, is uh, the non-communicable diseases. These are the most important area that we should be concerned about. Heart disease, diabetes, stroke, mental health, cancers, and chronic lung diseases. We have to worry about our new and emerging risk factors. I mentioned air pollution, climate change, and the zoonotic diseases. 
Digital health approaches to bring healthcare access to everyone. Universal health coverage is something that we are all talking about now. Everybody needs to access healthcare. We need stronger climate smart public health infrastructure and we need across the board capacity building and definitely greater investments for public health. All of us as health sector professionals have a responsibility to advocate for this increased investment in public health. And so closing with that question, which we started with, what can we do for a fairer, healthier and a greener world? Let us all understand that the central focus has to be health in all policies, any ministry, environment, in uh, uh, renewable energy, power, industry, agriculture. Everybody has to think about the health impacts. Economic recovery packages post COVID-19, a lot of ministries were talking about recovery packages. All of them must think of a healthy recovery. Think about what the health impacts of all the policies that is being made. Universal health care must be our goal. We should not leave anyone behind. If that means digital health, assisted telemedicine, so be it. If if it if it is getting health care to the people who need it the most, then we have to think about those uh, innovations as well. And this message that health, uh, the World Health Organization had put out last year, that we have to build back better. So this back was something that people were, why should we be going back? Why should we have this word back even? We have to go forward. So build forward fairer and faster is the message that I want to leave. So this is what we all have to think about. Think of some of the solutions that we talked about. And really uh, together we are trying to unravel the possible causes for current disease dynamics. We are all hoping together to make healthier and stronger societies. And our goal is a better world for all, especially our children. I think that should resonate for all of us. We have to leave. I think Dr. Paramesh really hit the nail on the head when he said in the beginning, we have received a certain world and a certain planet, we have to leave behind a clean and healthy one for our children especially. And uh, I'll close with um, uh, thank you to all of you for your patient listening and with deep appreciation to all my colleagues at PHFI, uh, my president and mentor, Dr. Srinath Reddy and Dr. Prabhakaran, who's our vice president and research policy. I think um, that is all from me. Thank you, sir. And so. Thank you, Dr. Purnima. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. I'm Dr. M.K. Sinaya. Uh, thank you for giving us 45 minutes of you know, wisdom pearls. You have taken us from, for the last 50 years, from the community medicine class, the basic where I learned, to my problems as a vice chancellor of a major university. Kerala Health Science University. So I think you have taken me through the whole thing. It was like a lesson plan. One by one, you are opening up. The best foundation was given by Professor uh, Dr. Paramesh, who said two great things. He said, uh, 22nd today and 7th, WHO and the World Environment. That's a very beautiful way of saying. He talked about the importance of uh, air, water, food. This was same as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Where these are the three things. Number one, you need clean air, then water, then food. The, all the rest can wait, but these three cannot wait for human survival. Then he also quoted, quoted our father, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and he said, whatever he inherited should be given back to our children. These are the three real, you know, wisdom pearls that he has said. And you have started the whole talk with uh, giving a nice background about uh, you know, focusing on health and talking back to infant mortality. Still, we are not able to reduce more than 30 to 34, which, which is the best indicator of our whole health system. That's what you focus. And the problem of budgeting, only 1.3% of uh, GDP. And all the increase has gone to Corona, rightly so, nothing wrong. 137% government of India has given, which is appreciated, appreciable, but that's why we are having COVID vaccine across the country free of cross. No country in the world has done that. So that's a great thing. Uh, you also talked about the new problem of COVID with 1 lakh t 1, 160 lakh COVID, 84, 85% survival. But the most important point you said is, that the environment is in the center of everything. 
you have talked about uh, pollution whether it is air water or the food and the deforestation which has created the whole lot of problems and leading on to emerging pandemics that's that you said so you also talked about epidemiological transition different kind of transition and the most important word you use is thought transition i think it is a nice word thought transition we need to look at health from a different perspective and the importance you brought into mental health because as a person who have been doing counseling for the last 41 years i'm really feeling when you said it i really felt that the most important thing especially the role of chemical toxins and heavy metals for creating some of this problem we are all all pediatricians are bothered with the emerging increase in the autism so that is something very huge concern for all of us and use focus about some solution better research low cost but the most important i like to was the low cost solutions i think that is something which we don't do it i just give an example i i i had a chart called doc developmental observation card which only says a two months child should have social smile four months head only eight months sitting one year standing make sure that your baby see hear and vision i have been talking about it for 25 years most people laughed at it what silly thing to talk about but now there is a national program by national neonatology forum called dictec highlighting the same thing so i had to wait 25 years for somebody to accept it that's a story in india it doesn't matter i am not restless at all i never get restless then uh, you talked about life course approach you know life cycle approach or life course approach i have done it from beginning and now at uh, 24 i have followed the low birth weight babies one year two year five year uh, 10 13 16 19 24 that led to the first doctor of science from kerala university and now 35 my my assistant is doing and i am bringing out a new concept called healthy aging you start from 35 itself the concept of healthy aging so that is something important now the focus on ncd you brought out and uh, sridhar reddy is a very close friend of mine we were together in the international clinical epidemiology network groups so i know him so well at one time he was the most searched author in the world and it was announced in one of the england meeting that world in the world most such other was sridhar reddy my regards to him uh, on this occasion and one thing you very nicely said the need for uh, you didn't use the word but what you meant is biopsychosocial model for medical care the moment you bring biopsychosocial the doctors obsession with cause it your you know anything any book you will see prevalence cause Uh, you know uh, pathology diagnosis try treatment but that's all but the patient comes in a whole lot of environment with lot of biology not biological there psychological and social determinant that is has to be brought in so that's what i have in fact i have as a vice sense like uh, start, started a word called healthcare counseling so everything i try to put now all my books and articles i try to say you write biology you write the psychosocial it with equal importance in fact for disability we have started a course called uh, you know developmental nurse counselor you know you brought the importance how you should use other you know other than doctors give them capacity whether to do bp whether to do anything bring them as a major partner we are doing it in disability by this course called developmental nurse counselor the developmental part for younger babies with disability and the counselor for the adolescent major important you gave lot of importance to household uh, air pollution and uh, and that is why we have probably one country which has given so much of gas connection in india so i don't know exact number but it was massive amount of gas connection to the housewives i think that point you probably miss out on that one then particulate matter importance of uh, all that i am not going to go into all that but the evidence what you said is that maternal exposure leading to low birth weight dr paramesh have been doing excellent amount of work i am little aware of all this because of his work in this area then you talked about uh, innovation task shifting that is very mobile technology and point of care devices excellent and nice word you use climate smart healthcare or health system 
that is something making people aware of that. Uh, but two, two points which you didn't say I would like to say is one is you miss out on when we talk of all this, the most important, you know, after stethoscope, the greatest discovery for the medical person was ultrasound. And we don't use that ultrasound because so much of impediments on a wrong cause. I don't want to go into that. Thinking that, you know, fe female feticide is because of that. Last 25 years, we did all restrictions on ultrasound, but female feticide has not come down. And no, the radiologists would agree that before 18 weeks, you unless you see a penis, you cannot say whether it's a male or female, because all of us develop as female. So there is a lot of issues in that one. Forget it, that's a debatable point. But what I'm saying is, if the if the ultrasound was taught to the, our nurses and they were permitted to use it, tele, telemedicine, I think even the remotest places a nurse could have given so much medical care than a doctor. And the last point on a little note, I'd say we all talk bad about Corona, but at the end of the day, I think Corona also has going to do us good. good. One, Corona has made all pediatricians jobless. We don't have any patient whatsoever. Nobody is getting ARI. Upper respiratory infection in children have almost disappeared after that one, which is, of course, negative. I'm just saying as a joke. But the more important thing, what country could never have done, that is tuberculosis control, I think we are going to uh, achieve it only because of the after effect of Corona, although Corona has its own problem. So, madam, I think it is a wonderful talk. It sounded so simple, but it had so much of innovative ideas. Now I call everybody for comments or discussion. We can start with Dr. Paramesh. Yes. Ishwat, uh, okay. Ishwat, can you hear me? Any any questions or comments? Please go ahead. He's the president of our uh, Comhad International. So on behalf of Comhad, I welcome you and thanks, uh, Madam Purnima, for that excellent talk. She has covered all the things, but we have to do a lot of things to improve our health in future, Madam. Yeah, and the points were summarized by NPC Nair were excellent. From my side, I will say. That uh, why not add to that the health definition, cultural health. We forgot our nature. We forgot our natural things. We forgot your old is gold theme. So we forgot all the old things where the health was very good in that case. But now in a industrialization and all these uh, na natural things we are forgetting. Even the food what we eat. It's a poisonous one, food. So why not to control the pesticides use? Because the pesticides also the soil, soil properties they are changing. Yes. What we are getting, we are getting the pesticides through the food. We are not getting the natural vitamins which are formed by the insects in the soil that we are forgetting. we should follow the nature the nature and we should follow whole culture of anywhere culture whether it's a living culture whether it's a food culture every level we are forgetting that and that we should introduce in your health system that is my suggestion madam thank you very much any questions any questions from anybody professor Srivasan? Ravi, yes please go ahead Ravi, go ahead. Unmute, unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Purnima, this was one of the excellent talks I heard on public health. A couple of things I wanted to just make a comment. Average life expectancy is still 68.7 years. I think it's still quite far behind uh, many other countries. If you compare, for example, Kerala, I don't know if you have the breakup because Kerala is a model for the rest of the India. Yeah. That is one thing. Secondly, you're also from Bangalore. And I'm a bit shocked to see that the average temperature rises six centigrade, six degrees centigrade. I'm sure we can all feel it, even at this time, it's almost 7.30, and we still feel we are sweating out in our apartments. It's 7 o'clock, it's quite hot. One question I have is, uh, 
maternal health maternal health and child health uh, is there any focus on disability because the organization which started off with disability as a focus now obviously it's health and disability any any uh, progress or any programs that has been taken up uh, so actually, uh, one of the centers of excellence, which is actually located in our Hyderabad campus, is a center for disability research. So it's led by our uh, director over there, uh, Dr. GVS Murthy, and they are centered. Uh, uh, a lot of their focus is on disability research. So I can. Uh, 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 Okay, madam. Uh, sorry. Please. Can, can I add one thing on that? I think the. Can you hear me? Yes. Sir. You know, the my focus in life has been on low birth weight, and three things we know very well, and that in terms of disability, the single most important cause for any disability is low birth weight, whether it is preterm or intrauterine growth retardation. Number two, most of the time, the excellent studies in India have shown that it's a poor height of the mother, which is the most important factor related to low birth weight. And when do the girl get the height? At the age of uh, pre-pubertal. We all talk about adolescent nutrition. What we need is before she has her menses, so two years when the breast bud appears, there's a gap for two years before she has a men menses. That is the kind of nutrition has to be given. And then the Barker hypothesis. What I have shown is, and that led to the DLC, is that the result clearly shows that not all low birth weight is the small for gestational type. You know, they have definitely high increase uh, hypertension blood pressure diabetes all you know ncds are there so and 30 percent is the low birth weight in india so i think the question is absolutely essential thing indian contest we cannot talk about any of this without focusing on the low birth weight thank you sir Thank you. You're very <laughs> actually my PhD was on this topic of uh, maternal height, parental height. Actually, looked at yeah, mother's yeah. father's height yeah. and uh, the birth outcomes and later life outcomes. The Barker hypothesis. My first 10-15 yeah. years work was around Barker's hypothesis. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hello. I have a question, Dr. Parmesh, if I may. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello, and thank you, Dr. Purnima, for such a lovely presentation. So uh, we are working on a health consultation program in Duvetia and also in terms I would want to question how are we doing when it comes to healthcare system in India? Because we know that healthcare is covered by most European countries and also they pay high taxes. But what do you see? Because 90% of the population are still in the rural areas. And also when you talked about 55%, you know, when it comes to the low use of fuel and how people are affected, is this 55% regardless of people now using gas and also controlled emission uh, measures? But but a question to you and to others is how are we faring on the healthcare system? Is government planning something? Um, thank you, uh, Doctor. I didn't get your name, but uh, yes. yes. Shall I tell? She is none other than assistant director of the uh, regional office of Future Earth. This is it is in this center, the center. She is the assistant director. Right now she is in Sikkim. Okay, pleasure Sweet to meet you. Last night. Yes. Yeah. With boss, that, see the boss here, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So she's asking that question. She's yeah. in charge of the eight countries in the Southeast Asia. All right, she's okay. She's here. Yeah. She's in charge of I think I'm put in charge of the health related issue. <laughs> Right. Yes, um, I'm pleasure uh, to meet you here and thank you so much for the question. Yes, I think uh, the, the healthcare access is a big uh, problem in India continues to be and I think there's a lot of work being done towards uh, universal health coverage. So one of the things is the Ayushman Bharat program that has been uh, the, no, uh, proposed to be rolled out uh, by the National Health Mission where uh, uh, people at a certain level of the society will be having uh, this access to healthcare at the lowest level of healthcare, you know, through the sub-health centers, which will be con converted into the health and wellness centers. 
So apart from that, yes, la large parts of our rural uh, tracts of the country still do not have access to health care. There's a lot to be done there, certainly. But I think it's it's also the doctor patient ratio and uh, so very many, you know, the enablers, the facilitators. There are so many factors. The ecosystem itself is not conducive at all still. But I think that's where we have to address the gaps. For example, the, the issue of task shifting leverage all the personnel that we have in our uh, workforce like you know why do the why does the burden have to be on the doctor we can shift it it will also address the livelihoods issue there are a lot of people who can be trained to be those care practitioners in between the doctor and the patient so access to healthcare there's a lot to be done i agree on in terms of your question on um, and the 55% who are still exposed to indoor air pollution. Uh, yes, there has been, uh, sir, I, Dr. Nair mentioned it, that I did not mention it. There was a lot to be spoken about policy. So the Pradhan Mantri Ujwal Yojana, which has rolled out those LPGs to households uh, across the country with the, with the woman of the household as the fulcrum of the program. She is the beneficiary. It was like uh, many, many households, 35 uh, uh, million or something, like something like that. But... The thing with that program is, though the penetration was high, the it, the problem was in the in sustaining that that program was what about the second cylinder and what about the access to the cylinder? Those issues have not been addressed. It is similar to uh, uh, like what has happened is, though the first cylinder has been delivered, a lot of times we have we have pictures that we have got from the ground where the the cylinder is sitting there, but they are still cooking in the firewood. The reason being cultural factors. The rotis taste better when you cook on the fire. So the messaging has to change. I think the, the woman of the household, the, the people at the household level have to be told that this is not about using a cleaner fuel just like that. We have not given you the LPG cylinder just for, for the sake of giving you. It is also about the health impacts. That messaging has to change to let people know why they have to transition to cleaner fuels for cooking. And uh, access issues continue. I think uh, the sustaining of the program is important. It includes behavior change communication. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, yes, um, it, there's lots more to be done for the implementation. OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Parmesh, uh, can we yes, comment? Yes, uh, Please, I'm sir, sorry. I am very uh, I apologize. Yes. I will be negative. Uh, India has very good doctors and very good public health professionals. But unfortunately, our political leaders don't listen to them. We will not have had the second surge if our leadership had listened to the doctors. I think we are worried about why it's happening. Why are having such good specialists in this country? But uh, our political leaders do whatever they want to do. And why is that communication between the public health professionals, especially in Karnataka, I heard the Technical Advisory Committee mentioned in November that there will be a surge in February. And still, it was ignored. So I think we had to worry about We had to worry about messaging that. Why are people who are professionals are not able to convince the leaders that it is in their interest to listen to them. I know it's a very controversial topic, but I think we have to add it. It cannot be suppressed. Thank you. I think Professor Srinivas is an outspoken person. He is a distinguished scientist. He is a founder here. He is none other than a nephew of the Nobel laureate Sir C. V. Raman. It's a great honor to have him here, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Yes, sir. Agree. I mean, it is something, uh, an area of concern for us, surely. I mean, the voices that need to be heard are often not heard. And it's a systemic problem, I guess. Yeah. Any other questions? If he's not there, we request our secretary, Ravi Kumar, to give a word of thanks. And we really thank for everybody to participation and Purima and MKC and our national president, our, grateful, our international president, Ashwan Patil. We're very and Achandra Shekhar Shetty, Vice Chancellor joined. And Srinivasan finally came. He never misses any one of those problems. Uh, he is a physician, but he is a scientist of the mathematics and physics. They are very precise. Two plus two is four. But health science is a science of probability. Two plus two can be three or five for us. <laughs> this is the situation. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Ravi. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, 
Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to put on record. It was an excellent talk by Dr. Purnima Prabhakaran and also ably chaired by our eminent doctor, Dr. MKC Nair. Sir, I think you made excellent summary. I think your, your summary was itself a presentation by itself. <laughs> uh, I would also appreciate uh, Dr. Eshwant Patil, International Comet President, uh, Dr. Parmesh, Dr. Jayoji Rao, and Dr. Srinivasan, and Dr. Smriti from uh, Daivicha Center. I'm sure Dr. Chandrasekhar is still there. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, as part of the uh, COMAT webinars, Lakeside Education Trust and also the Daivicha Center, which has provided all the necessary support in organizing these talks, we would like to thank one and all for actively participating. And uh, thank you once again, Dr. Purnima, for your excellent analysis and summary of your of this uh, favorite topic of Dr. Parmesh and all the members here who are uh, pivotal in the establishment of Comad. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It has been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.